Yeah, I realize you don't normally come to church to uh, have your pastor tell you that he wished a whole chapter of the Bible, especially a, a whole chapter of one of the Gospels, wasn't even in the book. But to be honest, that's a little how I feel about Matthew chapter 17. And, and the three stories that are primarily contained within it. Each story has unique problems. But you know, I actually feel that these are the kind of stories that I need to preach on rather than ignore and, and help us walk through more so than the ones which are more straightforward. So I want to do something a little unusual today uh, as we look at these three events in Jesus' life uh, and ministry. We're going to do them in reverse order, looking at the hardest first, working our way backwards towards an event that we call the Transfiguration. The last story in the chapter involves a fish and a coin. Now, let me, before we start, let me say that while we recognize four Gospels that accurately record the life and the ministry of Jesus, there are over a hundred documents in the writings of the early Christian church that are called Gospels and contain stories about Jesus. Many of these books contain stories of strange miracles that Jesus performed. Miracles unlike the ones that we normally read about in the four Gospels in our New Testament. For example, in one of these books, Joseph is working in his shop. He cuts a piece of wood too short. Jesus comes in and stretches the board to the correct size. In another one, the boy, Jesus takes a rock in his hands, tosses it up in the air, and it becomes a bird. The temptations of, in the temptations of Jesus, we see him reject the use of his power to do miracles that would simply uh, meet his need, need, his own needs, or, or do sensational acts to draw attention to himself or to amuse himself. Most of the supernatural events in Jesus' life follow those limitations. And that's one of the ways the early church differentiated between the apostolic gospels and the other one was to toss out the ones that were filled with strange supernatural events. That's why there are a hundred Gospels, but only four that we think accurately record Jesus' life. But this story in Matthew is so strange that many scholars think that it might be one of those legends that accidentally made its way into the normally reliable Matthew. In fact, after explaining it as best he can, even Dr. Dale Bruner says, problems remain with this miracle. It is not easy to like. Let me recount it briefly. All Jewish males over the age of 20 uh, are required to pay an annual temple tax of a half shekel. This was used for the upkeep of the temple and somewhat considered an atonement offering for a person's sin. Now, Jews from all over the world collected this tax every year and sent it to Jerusalem. We actually know that because we have records of Roman authorities intercepting these offerings on the way to Jerusalem and keeping them for themselves. A half shekel was roughly equivalent of two drachma, and a drachma was roughly one day's wage. So a collector of this tax comes to Peter and asks if Jesus pays the tax. Now, this may have been another way simply to trap Jesus and discredit him, or simply a polite way to remind Peter that Jesus' tax was due. And indeed, it does not seem that all the rabbis had to pay the tax. That's a little vague. So Peter talks with Jesus about this, and the main point of the story uh, is that Jesus uses it as a teaching opportunity to tell Peter about the unique relationship he has with the Father. The temple belongs to God. He is God's son. Kings don't tax their own children. Therefore, Jesus is not obligated to pay the tax. Again, uses it as a teaching opportunity. However, Jesus does not want this small issue to become a problem. Um, so he says... Uh, but so that we may not offend them, go to the lake, throw out your line. Take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. Now, that's just strange. It's not the kind of miracle Jesus does, is it? I mean, Luke tells us there were women who financially supported Jesus's, Jesus during his ministry. Every time Jesus needs money, he doesn't just pull it out of a fish's mouth, right? Now, some people um, understand Jesus to be telling Peter to go fishing and catch enough fish to pay for the tax. Um, one, others note that Matthew does, 
not record that Peter actually went out and did this, which is a significant omission. Be honest, regardless of any other explanations, I find it a strange story. Um, and one that I'm not going to resolve for you this morning. But let me share one interesting thing that I have learned. If you go to Israel, to the Sea of Galilee, you will probably be offered at a meal uh, St. Peter's fish. Um, it's either grilled or fried, usually whole, to give you the full effect. The fish is a very common one from the lake itself, and may indeed been the one that made up the large portions of Peter's normal catch when he was, uh, was a fisherman. Well, this fish is no longer exotic to us. We call it tilapia. You can buy it everywhere. Varieties of this fish exist all the way down the Rift Valley into Africa. And these fish have one very interesting characteristics. They protect their tiny babies by sucking them into their mouths. They're called mouth brooders. Uh, the fry are allowed out when it's safe, but when something happens to threaten them, the fish quickly inhales and sucks them back in. See what we got going here? Didn't think you were going to see this when you came to church today, huh? Um, here's a little school of them. Now, imagine what might happen if a small coin was dropped in the water in front of a fish. The fish would quickly inhale, drawing in the babies, and maybe the coin too. Maybe. I still don't like this story, but you know, it's not completely unrealistic. Second story. Jesus comes down off the mountain of the transfiguration to find his disciples frustrated after an attempt to heal a boy they believed to be demon-possessed. Matthew 17, 14 through 16. And when they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he says. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls in the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Um, and what's Jesus' response to that? Oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Okay, like, wow, what do they do to deserve that? I mean, just, you know. Here's a normal thing. Jesus, can you help? And boy, he just tees off on him, right? Uh, let me quickly explain a few things. I think there is an explanation of why the disciples failed. You know, if you look at the boy's symptoms, uh, doesn't that look a lot like epilepsy or some other seizure disorder? In fact, the Greek word that's used here for what he has is literally moonstruck, which is often translated epilepsy in modern works because people thought the moon had something to do with these seizures. Now, let me tell you, friends, I do believe in demon possession, and clearly some of the people ministered to were indeed demon-possessed. Um, I also think there were people who were ill, and people who didn't know about illness in the way we do only thought the issues of these people was possession. You'll notice, if you're looking in your own Bible, that verse 21 is actually missing from your Bible. That is because it appeared that around the 5th or 6th century, someone added that verse from Mark's telling of the event. It made its way into the King James Bible, but since then it's not been found in any of the earlier manuscripts of Matthew, and it's been removed. Mark adds a little more of an explanation to what went on. He says, after Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? And he replied, this kind can only come out by prayer. And I think a part of the problem is the disciples were trying to do an exorcism on someone who was actually ill. You know, we may exorcise demons, but we pray for the sick. In Matthew, Jesus then uses this example, uh, this event, as a faith lesson. But, but Mark's information is still important. Still, why does Jesus get so testy right off the bat? And I don't know that I have an easy answer for that. Perhaps he was responding to something specific in the crowd. After this healing is done, he lectures his disciples on the power of faith. Uh, so perhaps they simply had given up when they first didn't succeed. But I gotta tell you, I wonder if this isn't just a little bit of Jesus's humanity breaking through. Uh, a time with blessed communion with God and Old Testament saints on the mountains 
is immediately followed by chaos and conflict and human misery in the valley. It's like coming back from that vacation to a crisis in the workplace. Perhaps we can allow Jesus a single outburst to express the frustration that certainly must have happened with a perfect God taking human form and, and walking on our earth. You know, we can't say that Jesus was fully human and fully divine if we believe that his divinity completely shuts out his humanity. Apparently, even Jesus could get frustrated. Now, finally, the chapter begins with one of the best-known events in Jesus' life, the Transfiguration. I would love to show you a video of it, but only two of the more low-budget Jesus movies have this event, and none of them do it well. It's terribly hokey. So today, let me encourage you to believe that your imagination is far better. So our main text um, is from uh, the, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17, verses 1 through 8. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up to, up to a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was speaking, then, behold, a bright light overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them and says, Rise, and have no fear. And when they lifted their eyes, they saw no one but only Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, obviously, this is a very unique story. Transfiguration is essentially the Greek word metamorpho. You see, this is a yet another um, Greek word that you, you know that you didn't know. Meta, it's change. Or Facebook, depending on which one you use. Um, meta is change. Morph is form. So you know metamorphosis, right? Forces. That's the word used here. The text then literally says that Jesus' face lamped like the sun. His clothes become as light as light. Even the cloud that descends on them is described as a cloud of light. The light of the world is then revealed to us in nothing but pure light. Moses and Elijah suddenly appear. And it's probably no accident that two individuals appear who represent the law and the prophets. Yet they do not appear like Jesus, and God does not say, listen to them. It's clear that these events connect Jesus to the Old Testament, but also elevates him above it. Now I have to point out to you that this event contains one of the dumbest lines ever uttered in the Bible. Peter watches all this unfold, and for some reason feels that he needs to say something, because that's what Peter does, right? Yeah, we're going to just, uh, we're going to devote our whole fall to the letter of First Peter. You're going to love it. So much to tell us. But, but in Matthew 14, 17, we read, uh, Jesus said, Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, we'll put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Now, the words he uses probably means the temporary shelters of sticks and branches the Israelites put up in their fields during the harvest time. Um, you'll notice that uh, Jesus, God, Moses, and Elijah seem to pay absolutely no attention to his suggestion. In fact, God apparently cuts him off while he's still speaking. I kind of wonder if God didn't do one of those zip it, you know, things to him just to like shut him up. Um, but, but, you know, as Mark tells the story, he adds one line. And every now and then in Mark, we have a line that some people call a Peter over the shoulder line, where it looks like Peter is, is reading uh, Mark as he's writing the gospel, and he adds a, a note of correction. So Mark then explains why Peter says something this dumb. Uh, Mark uh, 9, 6, there's like a parenthesis and it says, he did not know what to say. They were so frightened. It, it's like Peter admitting, okay, I know that was really stupid. I was scared. <laughs> Um, now, I'm just about out of time, so let me wrap up here. 
why does this happen? And, and I think there are two reasons. Honestly, at first, I think it's for Jesus. You know, we don't think of Jesus as needing any help or encouragement. But after all, hey, I mean, he's part of the Trinity, right? But remember, the, the night that he's betrayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus desperately spends time with God to find the strength to face what's coming at the cross. He is, his, his soul is devastated. You know, here in Jesus' ministry, remember a couple of weeks ago, he is now turned and is heading to Jerusalem for his final conflict and for the cross. And he knew what was coming and how hard it was going to be. And perhaps he needed this encouragement uh, of this brief encounter with his father. And, and these affirmative words again, you know, this is my son whom I love. Again, it's the word agape, right? And with him I'm well pleased. And perhaps this is as much for Jesus' sake as for the disciples. We know Jesus needed regular times of communion with his God. With the coming rejection, torture, and death, perhaps even Jesus needed this kind of direct contact with God the Father to strengthen him for the time to come. Again, remember, he's as much human as he is divine. But certainly this event was also for Jesus' three disciples. Their whole view of Jesus had changed in the past week. They now understood that Jesus was both the promised Messiah and the Son of God. And they were now being challenged to see what that really meant. That Jesus was more than Moses or Elijah. That Jesus was actually following God's plan and that Jesus' path would take him not to earthly glory but to a cross and initially a tomb. They needed a bigger picture of who Jesus really was. Not just to understand who he was for them but also they needed a bigger God to face what they would have to face in the coming years. You know, James was the first apostle to be killed for his faith. Peter would die in Rome, crucified upside down. John would be imprisoned several times. They needed a bigger Jesus for these challenges. And they find that bigger Jesus on this mountain. There's a great scene in C.S. Lewis's Narnia book, Prince Caspian. Unfortunately, the movie version left most of it out and lost so much of the genius of, of Lewis's story. It was the worst of the Narnia movies. Let me read to you a few lines. It comes when young Lucy finally meets Aslan near the end of the book. Now remember, Aslan is the Christ character in these stories. Lucy hasn't seen Aslan since her last time in Narnia, but she suddenly sees him in a glade. This is what Lewis writes. A circle of grass smooth as lawn met Lucy's eyes, with dark trees dancing all around it. And then, oh joy, there he was, the huge lion, shining white in the moonlight, his huge black shadow underneath him. But for a moment, movement of his tail, he might have been a stone lion, but Lucy never thought of that. She never stopped to think whether he was a friendly lion or not. She rushed to him. She felt her heart would burst if she lost a moment. And the next thing she knew was that she was kissing him and putting her arms around his neck as burying her face in his beautiful, rich soakiness of his mane. Aslan, Aslan, dear Aslan, sobbed Lucy. At last, the great beast rolled over on his side so that Lucy fell half sitting, half lying between his paws. He bent forward and just touched his nose, her nose with his tongue. His warm breath came all around her. She gazed up into his large, wild face. Welcome, child, said Aslan. And Lucy said, you're bigger. That is not because you're older, little one. That is because you are older, little one. He answered, not because you are, she said. I am not, but every year you grow, you will find me bigger. Isn't that Lewis's genius? Every year you grow you will find me bigger. And friends, you see, Narnia is not just a story about a magical world and a magical lion. It's a message about you and me and our relationship with Jesus Christ. As we grow in our relationship with God, as we understand more of God's love and mercy and grace and power, God gets bigger. And it's not that God is growing or getting older. It's our own understanding of his true majesty that grows as we know and love and serve him more. The transfiguration of Jesus is an ongoing process in each of our own hearts. So friend, how big is your God? 
Is he growing? Is he small and manageable? Easy to put aside when you don't need him? Easy to ignore when you're too busy? And consequently too small to do you any good? When you truly need the grace of the creator and sustainer of all things? Because if that's the case, maybe you need to trip up that mountain too. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this great story, this great thing that happened in your ministry that gave these three key followers of yours uh, the courage to face the future, the, the ability to see you for something far greater than they imagined. As they grew closer to you, you grew bigger to them. May that be the same for us. For we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, go from this place and take God with you. May you find that he grows each and every day in your hearts. And may his grace, his mercy, his peace, and his presence be with you now and forevermore.